bless your name. Lord, we remember tonight, Lord God, that no matter what life looks like, Lord, you have done something so profound, so deep inside of us, Lord God, that despite of what may sometimes, Lord God, come our way, despite of the things that sometimes the Spirit allows us to see in our own character, our own lifestyle, our own journey, Lord. Sometimes those things seem so big, and yet you keep us in a place where we don't feel like running, Lord God. We, we can sing. Lord, and the things that hurt, hurt, Lord God, and the things that are difficult are difficult, but yet, Lord God, you have caused us to never be alone in any of it anymore, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that we can sing it as well with my soul. When we are still growing, when we are still figuring things out, when we are still learning and still making all kinds of mistakes, Lord God, you've given us the ability to sing in the midst of of what we go through. And Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, that you have done something so powerful that a sinner can sing in the midst, Lord God, of their journey. It is well with my soul. What my God has done has caused me to be able to say, it already is well with my soul. Lord, we bless you. Lord, all we can do is lift our hands to you and just bless you, Lord God, from the mouth that used to curse people, Lord God, and not regard you at all, Lord God. We choose now, Lord, to simply bless you, Lord God. That's truly all we can give to you, Lord, is to bless your name, Lord God, and to let you be enough, to let you be the reason, God, that we can say it is well, to let you be the reason that we lift our hands tonight, Lord God, to let you be the reason, Lord. Everything else may be challenging, but you are enough reason for us. You have delivered us, you've set us free, and you have forgiven us, Lord God, when we did not even ask you for a solution to our guilt. You gave us forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for bringing that message into our life that we may believe it. Thank you, God, for sending people into our life that are willing to not be quiet about your gospel, not be quiet about the hope that you give to anyone that is willing to repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, you are good to us tonight. It is well with our soul. And you, Lord God, are the reason. We thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. You guys may take a seat. I have decided that I'm not going to say anymore that I'm excited because I seem to repeat myself an awful lot. So if I'm excited, you're going to find out by experience. But this week, um, I'm anticipating, I'm anticipating a very nice teaching. Um, we're going to talk about codependent relationships. Codependent relationships. We started off with a teaching on depression. We did a teaching on eating disorders. And tonight, it's going to be a teaching on codependent relationships. Now, before we get too deep into that, I want to give you a couple of definitions to help you understand what we're talking about and to help you understand in clarity what we're talking about as we go through this teaching using some terminology that you may or may not be very familiar with. Now, the word dependent means this, contingent on or determined by. So. I'm dependent on my God because he gives me breath in my lungs. So I'm so dependent on God that unless he gives me breath, there's not going to be passive tonight. And I'm also determined by my God. He, I am what he says I am. I am forgiven when he said I am forgiven. I am dependent on him. So it is contingent on or determined by depending 
on whether your credit card is accepted or not, you're going to walk out of the stores with your groceries. That's a good use of the word depending. It depends. It is contingent on you making an exchange for those groceries of equal value or probably a little bit greater value, but that put aside. Codependent means this. It is excessive emotional and or physical reliance. Very different. Excessive emotional reliance or physical, uh, psychological, sorry, psychological reliance. This is what Oxford Languages says about codependent people. Codependents confuse caretaking and sacrifice with loyalty and love. I'll say that again. Not my words. Oxford Languages. Codependents confuse caretaking and sacrifice with loyalty and love. So someone that is a codependent, them making unreasonable sacrifices for someone else is them saying, no, 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 I, I love this person. This is me expressing my love. And them taking care of someone, a one-way street, is them saying, no, 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 I'm loyal to this person. That's what a codependent person does. They confuse caretaking and sacrifice with loyalty and love. Now, I'm going to ask Russ to bring me my Bible, please. Um, I'm going to read to you guys Matthew 22, starting in verse 36. Matthew 22, starting in verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now that last verse, verse 40, I'll read it again. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What does that mean? That means everything God had said, that's what that represented. Law, what God had spoken, that's, that's law. There's no way around it. It is what it is. The positive things, the negative things, the commands, the... Everything God speaks is, is law. It stands by the authority of God. Everything that God has said and then everything that God will speak to humanity through humanity. That would be a prophet. When God speaks through a person into your life and brings divine truth at the appointed time, now the Lord speaks through a person. It's a prophetic word. It is an edifying word. It is something that God gives to you so you can grow so you can stand and so you can improve in your journey together with Him. This scripture tells us that both what God has ever said and everything He will ever speak through a person to a person will always be bound by these two things. It will be bound by loving the Lord with all of your heart, all of your soul and all of your mind and loving others as yourself. It will never contradict these two things. It is limited to the boundaries within these two things. Now to love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind is the first and the greatest commandment. Lord Jesus says that. Now to love Him with your heart, not that complicated. A lot of people love with their heart. They understand what that means and they understand what it takes to give God your heart, to give Him your desires, to, give, to allow Him to satisfy your heart. To allow Him to have all of your heart, your desires, your adoration. He, he is now the object of your praise. But then to love Him with all of our soul, which really means also our body. To love God with your body and to not give your body or seek bodily satisfaction in other things but God. And then to love God with all of your mind, to allow your mind to be saturated with God's truth, God's word, and to be generally focused on God, and then from time to time also take care of other things, and not the other way around. A lot of people live very busy with many, many things, and then they remember God. Other stuff is on their mind. When you've given your mind to the Lord, God is on your mind. And you have to, you know, you need to keep a list. I need to keep a list. 
that may be my age, but I need to keep a list to also remember to do everything else I got to do today because God has my mind. I'm focused on what He wants to do today. I'm focused on what He knows I need to hear from the Word today, from Him today, because He knows what's coming down my way. He knows the people I'm going to encounter. He knows the disappointments I'm going to encounter. He knows what's going on. So He needs to have my mind so that I'm never caught off guard and then taken down by a situation or even a person caught so off guard that now I realize, ooh, I really didn't love this person as myself. Learning to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and then others as yourself. Now, very interesting wording, others as yourself, because that implies an interdependent relationship. So there's a form of dependency, but it's interdependent, so it's equal. That means, for example, God can encourage one person through another person, but that person that is being encouraged is not dependent on that other person for their encouragement. They're dependent on God, and God may use another person just like He may use that person now to maybe next week encourage the other way around towards the first person that encouraged. That is an interdependent relationship. We are dependent on each other to work together according to God's plan to become the body of Christ. But my dependency, the very thing that I'm contingent upon, or my life is contingent upon, and, and the very thing that determines me and how well my day is going, is God. When you fail in your interdependency, or your brother or sister fails you in their interdependency, your day should not change because you're dependent on God. And contingent on if God changes, well then your day would change. Or your situation would change. But God says, I never change. And depending on whether God changes His mind about you, that may determine how you're going to turn out. But God has already let us know, I never changed my mind, and I'm telling you my mind. It's right here. I'm for you, not against you. I'm with you to deliver you. I always go before you. I will walk behind you. Your teacher will walk behind you. The Spirit will walk behind you to show you this is the way. Walk in it. We know these things. So when we are dependent on God, our day goes by very well. When we're interdependent, loving others as ourselves, with other people, then there's an equally depending, the type of depending that builds relationships. So that is the interdependence. That, that is the interdependence between two people. If we both do what Jesus asks us to do, for one another, then we end up in healthy relationship. When we transfer our dependence to a person, we always end up in unhealthy relationships. Are you getting this? Dependency on God, then we are able to be interdependent with people. If our dependency is on people, we'll always have unhealthy relationships. I'm going to try to make this simple because I like to make it simple for myself. It helps me understand things. If you can't get it out of yourself, then you shouldn't look for it in others. It's that simple. If you can't get it out of yourself, then you should not look for it in others. It ends up, who's your well? Who is the person that you draw from? that you like to get something from that you're not finding in yourself. Is that person God or is that person here on earth? That's really the question. You can't get certain things out of yourself. Don't look for them or even hope to find them in others. You don't have certain things in yourself. Other people don't have them either. When you have two people that are in an agreement in a relationship, whether it is friends or whether it is people that are in a romantic relationship or even marriage, when people have an agreement that says, I want to get certain things out of you and I will try to give you certain things out of me, you have two dry wells trying to get water from each other. That's, that's the picture. And sooner or later, that's going to end up very dry. Amen? If one of the two begins to get their water from the well that never runs dry, if one of the two begins to seek after 
Jesus and receive from Jesus what they could never find in humanity, all of a sudden the other person generally will either get very upset or they become very, very curious and very encouraged to the fact that now their satisfaction that actually can be found with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, look to God and just love Him. I'm going to read to you something uh, from Freeman Christ Ministries from Canada. Um, we use a lot of their resources and a lot of the stuff that I learn, I learn from their materials. Um, I'm going to read to you a little piece on codependent relationships. Codependent relationships are like a people addiction. In codependent relationships, people are hoping that others will meet their needs. In this type of relationship, one person needs to be needed, and the second person is very needy. These people seem to be attracted to one another like the opposite poles of a magnet, and are difficult to separate once connected. These relationships usually exclude a relationship with God. They are so engrossed with the other person that they don't have time to see or need for God. God does not call us to be to codependent relationships, but instead we are to be in a dependent relationship with Him and in healthy relationships with people. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about addiction because many addicts are married to a codependent spouse. And these addictions range from addicted to any type of substance to addicted to their job, a workaholic, um, rageaholic people that are just, they cannot but have anger explosions, you name them. Um, a lot of the time an addict is married to a codependent spouse. And this kind of spouse will do everything they can do to keep the addict fulfilling their marriage obligations and promises. So the, the codependent spouse, the one that, that loves to be needed, um, is, is, is the one that actually seeks to put boundaries, but it doesn't really matter when they're broken. They, they seek to really make the other person into somebody they're not. And they're working incredibly hard to do it. And every time that person proves that they are not the person the codependent spouse hopes they one day will become, there's no consequences. Uh, in the process, a codependent spouse is or becomes willing to overlook any type and severity of dysfunction in the marriage and even parenting. It's mentioned, it's talked about, maybe be behind the front door. But beyond that, it becomes a willingness to overlook because the codependent spouse needs to do that in order to keep the person that they are addicted to in the place that they want that person. They need that person in their life and they can't risk anything that could possibly risk losing that person or pushing that person out. In all of this, the spouse if they are codependent, has become the enabler of the addict. Codependent spouses or partners do not report, this is important, this is how you know, this is one of the last steps to identify. Codependent spouses or partners do not report physical abuse, they do not report drug abuse, and they do not report alcohol abuse. They are willing to overlook this function in order to keep the person they're addicted to someone. In being willing to overlook the addict's sin, the spouse now has become a contributor that extends the addiction cycle. You, you need to get this, because I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with this. I've severely dealt with this before I got saved. Um, but if you ever get around someone, or if you are ever in a situation, or you see ever any tendencies in yourself or your spouse, there's great hope but you have to deal with sin. When somebody is willing to put a person in the place that God demands, it's not gonna end well. It won't. So the loving and the right thing to do is to deal with it as soon as loving, but as direct and as 
determined as you can. You cannot have grace. I've said this many times to most of you individually. You cannot have grace on people's darkness. You love people. You have grace on people. But you can never have grace on their darkness. It's trying to kill them. If you love people, you've got to deal with their darkness. In suicide prevention, the first thing they teach you is you can either save somebody's life or be their friend. Pick. You can't do both. Codependent spouses or partners don't report physical abuse, drug abuse, or alcohol abuse. A codependent spouse has taken really God's place in the life of an addict because what they first do is submitting to the sin of the addict depending on them. The addict is really here not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that the codependent spouse is okay for the addict to be solely dependent on them and to be solely needy for them and to always come running back to them. A person that is willing to love God and have healthy relationships with others always is in the business of helping people run to God and not to other people. Knowing what will happen when a person becomes addicted to people, you're always going to try to help them run to God. Amen? Again, you can either be someone's friend or save their life. Sometimes, I know that sounds severe, but sometimes it is that real. In confirming the sin of allowing an addict to depend on a person, in confirming this sin, the addict now flourishes in their addiction. That's the end result. The addict now flourishes in their addiction, or the addiction shape shifts. You have addicts that become incredibly grateful and they, they, they exp over express their, their gratefulness, but the addiction shape shifts. So now maybe it's not a substance anymore, but you know, now they're smoking 50 cigarettes a day. I'm just, I'm just naming something. Um, but because it's not that harmful, you know, it's a, it's a lesser evil great, you know, or it shape shifts to uh, uh, drinking first, or it shape shifts to becoming a workaholic, or it shape shifts to just becoming obsessive about a hobby. It's, 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 it shape shifts when it's not dealt with. It's not gone. Darkness, you need to get this, darkness is like a chameleon. It's willing to change in whatever it needs to change to survive. If you don't deal with it, it will shape shift just for survival's sake. Whatever it needs to you know, change into so that you will let it live, it'll do it. No problems, no questions asked, as long as I'm allowed to exist, as long as, I'm, as the darkness is allowed to stay, it will confirm, it will transform to whatever it needs to in order to stay and hold a grip on someone's life and keep them from loving God with all of their heart, mind, and strength, and soul. Darkness can't have a person find out that there's actual freedom. Darkness can't have a person find out that God actually loves them, that God is actually for them, that He's willing to be in relationship. So darkness has to do one of two things, either corrupt your beliefs or corrupt your way of repentance. Block it. Keep it in the dark. Keep it a secret. Keep it away. It's going to be either one of the two that darkness seeks to do. I want to talk to you briefly about homosexuality, both um, for, for both genders, really. A lot of homosexuality is born out of codependent relationships between same-sex friends. They were simple friends, they were good friends, and somewhere down the line, usually very caught off guard, homosexuality comes into play. Many Christians Many Christians that have practiced homosexuality confess afterwards that they originally had no sexual attraction to the same sex or any interest at all. But they came to a place where they felt, I have to have him or her in my life, no matter the cost. I need this person in my life. And when they came to this point, now one human is addicted to another human. This addiction always births perversion. When one person says, I need this person in my life no matter the cost, this addiction always births 
perversion. Many people addic addicted to a person of the opposite sex that want that person in their life, despite of any possible dysfunction that may be in the relationship, any disapproval of God about the road that they are taking to have this person in their life, um, they'll always seek to find the strongest bond they know of to seek and bind themselves to the other person. Usually that ends up being a sexual relationship. Now, when two people of the opposite sex go into that, we generally regard it as normal, it's the exact same thing. When one person says in their heart, I need this person in my life, usually at that point, there's already dysfunction in the relationship. It's not the most happy place on earth. It's not the best working place on earth. There is arguments, there is disagreements, there isn't a healthy reasoning, there isn't healthy fighting and then resolve. There is already dysfunction. Despite the fact that it's not the perfect relationship they want so bad in their life, they now want a certain person in their life and all of a sudden it turns into a seeking for something that will guarantee that that person stays. That's often where fornication comes in any type of sexual relations outside of marriage, one man and one woman is regarded as fornication according to the word of God. At that point in doing so, in accepting in yourself or the other person, dependency on another person, sin makes a way for the next and the next and the next step. And binding yourself to a person or binding a person to you, where do you end up? You end up in bondage. You've been binding, but in areas where God never led you, in things that God never had for you, and what you reap now is confusion, is death, and dysfunction. And all that you do is trying to hold on harder, but it's not working. Until God gets his hands on it, it is not working. At this point, you have sought something or someone other than God with either all your heart, all of your mind, or all of your soul. Now I'm going to give you the challenge for people that either recognize at one point in my life I had some of these tendencies which would be me or people that say you know I know people so I really want to understand this or people that say you know I'm a little bit struggling with some of these thoughts or some of these things right now or I'm full blown in it. I'm going to give you the challenge and I'm going to give you the solution. Amen. The challenge for a person struggling with codependent tendencies, let's call them that. The challenge is this. The challenge for them is to trust that God will meet their needs. It's that simple. That's the challenge. To actually trust that God will meet their need. Why is that the challenge? Very, very, very logical. But I had to learn this, so I'm going to teach it as well. Why is that the case? Often authority figures, parents, in the young life, and sometimes even teenage years, they did not properly and consistently meet the child's physical or emotional needs. When that happens early on in life, somebody in that position can learn a very, very logical, yet detrimental lie. They believe the lie that simply states that if an earthly authority figure can't meet my needs, then God also can't meet my needs. And it's, they, they never say this, but that's the equation they come to. When you're, when you're a little bitty kid, who's the strongest daddy in the world? It's my daddy. You know, it's, it's almost you, 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 you give many, and the word does this too, you give many God-like attributes to your father. That he's the strongest in the world. He loves me the most in the world. He's the best. He has the greatest job in the world. It's your daddy is your, is your everything. And then, and then mom also, like they, they are so much bigger than you are. When I think back to being a kid, they, they felt like giants, you know? And, and when at that place in your life, your needs, either physically or emotionally, were not consistently met, 
not always does, but it can very well happen that something starts to birth in your heart. So when I have this big authority figure in my life that doesn't guarantee that my needs are met at all, that doesn't guarantee that I'm consistently going to get what I need and I feel too little to go get it myself. People that are codependent, they're codependent for a reason. They don't, they're not strong people that try to make it all work by themselves. They're looking for something in another person. They're not self-sufficient. They don't even try to be. They're running after another person because in themselves they can't find it from the authority figure that got drilled into them and the young age, they can't find it and they won't get it, so they're looking for someone else. And when they find a man or a woman that seems to fill these needs perfectly now, and these may, this may not mean that it's a nice relationship. This may not mean that they're, that they're never fighting. This may not mean that it's all butterflies and roses. But it's going to feel like that for the, for the codependent person. It's going to feel like their needs are finally met. They're needed here. They're wanted here. They're cared for here. There's going to be consistency here. It may look as dysfunctional as you can possibly imagine. The codependent person wants it. And they want to hold on to it because this is my person. This is the one. This is going to work for me. And finally, fill my needs. When a codependent person finds a man or woman that seems to fill these needs perfectly, now they feel it's God's will to completely commit to this other person. You'll hear people say, well, God wants me to be happy, and this person makes me happy, so what do you mean this is not God's will? What do you mean I shouldn't sleep around outside of marriage? What do you mean? What do you mean homosexuality is a sin? Doesn't God want me to be happy? Now God would like for you to be eternally happy. That's why he sent his son to deliver you from sin. But the problem begins when we become our own judge. A codependent person is their own judge in the sense that they believe that they can identify what is going to fill their needs. What God says, they don't believe that's true for them. Yes, of course God is God. They may have respect for God. But to allow God to be everything for them, to love God with all of their heart, all of their mind, and all of their strength, all of their soul, they do not believe that that is going to be the fix for their problem. And we're going to see in a minute that the Word clearly teaches that it is. You cannot take to man what belongs to God and experience wholeness, healing, and satisfaction. Those three things, generally, people are running for. They're seeking wholeness, they're seeking to be complete, they're seeking emotional healing, and they're seeking satisfaction in life. You can't have these things if you take to man what belongs to God. You simply need to repent of the thinking that it's okay for you to depend on another person or, or, or on other people. When you say, I depend on you to somebody, which I'm not telling you to never say that I understand in certain contexts that would not be a wrong statement. But when you say, I depend on somebody, what you're saying is, I am determined by what so-and-so is going to do. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be defined by what so-and-so is going to do. That's what the word dependence means. That's why we have to be dependent on God so that when I say I'm dependent on God, I'm saying I'm determined by my God. I'm, I'm carried by my God. I'm fulfilled by my God. I'm kept by my God. I'm filled up by my God. And when I get around you, we can have now a healthy relationship because I'm not looking to get anything anymore. I'm already filled up, but I'd like to be obedient to my God and I'd like to give to others and I'd like to care for others. So. Could we do relationship? A healthy relationship, get this, a healthy relationship, a person in a healthy relationship isn't looking for anything. Somebody got to write that down. A person in a healthy relationship is not looking for anything. They're ready to give. That's why they're in relationship, because they have something to give. Because they have a well that gives them more than they need. 
their needs are met, but the well never runs dry, so they are able to keep on giving. You cannot take to man what belongs to God and experience, experience wholeness, healing, and satisfaction. God will meet your needs if you trust Him and love Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. I will take you to Psalm chapter 1. We're going to read the first three verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. You have all three here. Who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. In other words, their mind is not given to things that are unlike what God is saying. Then the word tells us, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and He meditates on it day and night. That's the heart. He meditates on it. He, he wants to take it in. He's given all of His heart to it. And then the soul, the entire being, nor, uh, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Anywhere they go, anything they do with their entire soul, their entire being, they are not willing to depart from what God has to offer, offer them. Meditating day and night, that implies it has your time. That implies your heart is wholly given to these things. What God has said, what God has spoken into my life. What God has promised for my situation. As Allah comes up, I'm going to bring it home. I'm going to read to you one more time, verse 3. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. In other words, there will always be provision. There will be a well for you. It will never run dry. You'll be in the right place at the right time. And you will never, ever have to look for water through or by somewhere else or someone else that brings forth its fruit in its season. In other words, it's coming to its purpose and it's producing fruit. That means you have more than enough for yourself. Now there's fruit to be given away and to be taken away for others. Whose leaf will not wither. In other words, the glory won't change, the, the honor won't change, the, 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 the relationship with the water will always, always be visible. There will always be green leaves. And whatever he does, will prosper only when you're in that place are you going to learn how to love others as yourself you can't get anything out of yourself but you can care for and you can honor the temple of the holy spirit that's what you can do for yourself you can care properly for yourself and you can honor the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're going to pay attention to what you eat and how you eat. You're going you're gonna to honor yourself as a child of the living God. You're not going to beat yourself up for sin. You're not going to feel guilty for how, God, for how much God has forgiven you. You are willing to be forgiven. You are willing to come into the will of God. And you are willing to honor Him as Creator by the way that you treat this tent, the body the tent of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's inviting us to do for others as well, to honor them and to care for them. But until you do number one, until you love the Lord with all of your heart, mind and strength, you will always break number two. You can't do number two right if you are not doing number one. You will still try to get out of others what you can't find in yourself. And when you're still trying to get out of others, what you can't find in yourself, you are always on the road to a codependent relationship. You're always going to end up in an unsatisfying, unstable, undirected relationship that is putting God in a place where He needs to put a stop to it. This is a threat to your life. This is a threat to your spiritual health. This is a threat to the journey that He has for you. You need to simply repent. It's not complicated. Repentance means to change your mind. 
And you gotta be simply willing to say, it's not okay for me to put my dependence on other people. I am called to depend on God, to love Him with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my mind. He's enough. Let me give you a little bit of hope. Proverbs 1, verse 23. We'll read 22 as well. How long, you simple ones, are without knowledge? Will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. There's your hope. If you are willing to change your mind, you find yourself in a place where you say, Man, I've been doing everything I can to hold on to a person, to hold on to a relationship. I've even done or accepted unhealthy stuff, even though I could see right clear as glass right now. It wasn't unhealthy. It wasn't because it was the greatest relationship. I was addicted. I wanted this and I just went out to get it. And I even went into bondage to get it. When you repent, when you change your mind and say, God, I'm going to agree with you. God, I'm not asking you to bless my ways. I'm looking for yours and I'm willing to change my journey to now submit and obey your direction. He says, surely I will pour out my spirit on you and I will make my words known to you. In other words, you're going to be planted by that water. The Holy Spirit is many times throughout the word likened to water. There's going to be constant feeding that the Lord will do. There's a constant filling that the Lord will do. There's a constant care that the Lord will give. He will meet your needs. Let me give you verse 32 and 33. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. That's 32. Now that word turning away is, is waywardness. Waywardness means this. It means when you're very easily inclined to do stuff. Impulsive, you're wayward. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're following your feelings, you're wayward. When you're easily jumping into stuff, you're, you're, it's, it's difficult to predict what, what, what you're going to do next. The word tells us, for the waywardness of the simple will slay them. And the complacency of fools or, or the ones that, that say, you know, I'm good. I don't need to necessarily know what God has to say about this. I'm fine here. I feel pretty good about all this. I'm good. But whoever listens to me, look at this, 33. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. A person stuck, trust me, they don't want to be there. A person stuck in codependency does not feel safe. They fear evil all the time. That's one of the biggest motivations for them to do what they're doing. They're constantly afraid. They're constantly feeling unsafe. Nothing is guaranteed. They have to work hard to keep that person in their life. You know why you have to work so hard to keep that person in your life? Because you brought them in your life. And when God gives you a person, when God brings two people, healthy people together, that now have an interdependent relationship where it is because of God that they're giving. It is because of God that they're not looking to take. It is because of God that they're not leading towards a road of sin. Now all of a sudden there's a relationship that is beautiful, an example, enjoyable. If you struggle in any way, shape or form, I want to invite you to simply repent in your thinking. It's not okay for you to be dependent on a person. You are called to be dependent on God. And when you repent and become dependent on God, when you love Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, He will meet your needs. You can trust Him. And you're called to love Him. 
This is something you can do. You get to give away your heart, you get to give away your mind, and you get to give away your soul. Some of us are willing to give it away to get something from people that we want from them. And the invitation is who is willing to give it all to God, trusting that He is the one that can satisfy, keep us, fill our needs, and love us, and will keep His word. He will never break His word to you. Never. He'll never disappoint you. I want to invite you guys to stand with me. When we choose to repent, and I do this daily, guys, there's one time where you, where you repent, truly repent for the first time in your life, and you say, I repent of my own belief. I now believe with all of my heart that because of the cross of Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. I may still work through a lot. I may still carry a lot of crap with me, but I know that I'm forgiven because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Then we get into a relationship with the Lord, and He invites us to live a lifestyle of repentance so that every time he may pour his spirit towards you and he may he may plant you time and again closer to that water closer to that river that's why he's seeking all the time to make suggestions to your mind for life's sake he said would you change your mind about this would you would you allow me to show you what the truth is about this if you're willing to change your mind i'll send you my spirit I'll do the impossible, I'll satisfy you, I'll fill your needs, but would you be willing to change your mind? Lord, we love you. Lord, we bless you, God. Lord, and I'm willing today, Lord God, to change my mind, Lord God, and to humble myself under your word, and to say, Lord, I should never have dependency, Lord God, on anyone else, Lord God, but on you. Lord, I want to learn continually to love you, Lord God, with all of my heart, all of my mind, and all of my soul. Lord God, I'm only starting to beginning to learn. Would you teach me every day? And as you teach things to my mind, Lord God, I'm willing to repent. I'm willing to change my mind according to what you're speaking, according to what you're whispering, Lord God. Because I believe, Father, that you will plant me by the water, Lord God, that you will cause me to bear fruit, that you will cause my leaves to be green. I believe that you will satisfy the human, Lord God, that you will satisfy me as a person, my entire soul, Lord God, my entire mind and my entire heart. I believe, God, that you are Lord of all. I believe, Lord God, that you keep your word. I believe, Lord God, that I was created, Lord God, to have relationship with you, to be in communion with you, and that I can never truly feel alive and never truly feel at peace. I never truly feel satisfied unless I'm in that relationship. God, Lord, I understand that you desire a marriage, that you desire to be a bridegroom and not one of many people that I have relationship with. You want all of my heart. You want all of my mind. And you want all of my soul. But you promise that I will be planted. You promise that I will experience safety. You promise that I will not be afraid of evil anymore. And you promise that my relationships will be healthy and a blessing to all. Lord, you are good. Lord, so I'm going to go with what you say tonight, Lord. I'm going to trust you. Lord, we want to bless you tonight. Thank you, God, that there is such a way out of a codependent relationship. Lord, some of us may not have known or realized some of the things we have done or some of the things we made possible for others. Lord, today we are willing to change our mind, awaiting, Lord God, hopefully awaiting, Lord God, that you will pour your spirit, that we may be changed and filled up and full of joy in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
See you.